Hello and welcome back to another Clubs and Corks Golf Podcast. Luke Taylor here, Ben Curtis, Bernice. Bernice's owner, Ben yeah. Curtis. <laughs> it's amazing what you have to buy to, when you win a tournament. I know. Well, this is the best money I ever spent, though. I know. That's what uh, I said about my body. Yeah. So I'm excited. We have someone that's another not, Canadian. Another Canadian. I, another uh, Canadian. But not related to anything <laughs> Kent State, which is even better. Because that puts my total up to 6'5". I'm winning. And I like to win. I do. Okay. But don't forget, uh, why, uh, podcast brought to you by Keaton Vineyards. Also, subscribe, rate, and re- review. You know, your, your thumbs, thumbs up, thumbs up yeah. and crap like that. People just, like, pound that. They're like, oh, you got to do this, got to do that. Yeah. Like us, whatever. Whatever yeah. it is. So I'm excited. So this is... What, uh, what number is this, Canadian? Like, fifth, sixth? You know what you call a Canadian gold medal in the Summer Olympics? <laughs> Eighth place. <laughs> Oh, he's, boy. he's laughing there. He's laughing. He likes that. So I'm excited. I didn't know they had a sports hall of fame where this guy's from. He's from Burlington. I'm from Oakville, yeah. the big O. And you know, when you said you went to Notre Dame secondary school, I went to St. Thomas Aquinas. It brought back flashbacks. Cause you had these two tall motherfuckers, like six, nine and six, seven. And I had to guard the six, seven guy. And my high school coach, who's a legend, decided me to do the tip off once against the six, seven guy. You and I'm six two. It was embarrassing. <laughs> I jumped and it's like I got to as like I would just stand there. Oh, like, that was yeah, embarrassing. That was embarrassing. Yeah. But real interesting background. Went to yeah. Tennessee State uh, University. Played for Katiana Starks, first black woman to ever coach an NCAA women's go- or men's golf team. Wasn't even a golfer. Was a men's swimming and diving coach. <laughs> His dad was a head of referees for the Canadian Soccer Association. That's pretty impressive. But my favorite was. In 2006, his, him and his wife, Kate, quit their jobs and moved from Toronto to Orlando so he could pursue a career as a Disney theme park character. <laughs> Sean Foley, so, welcome to the cl- club. He, he does the Texas. longest introductions ever. Yeah. If you haven't noticed. Yeah. But Sean, good to be with you. Thanks for you coming too, on. I can't believe you agreed with him. But yeah. I, I guess you know it, when it came to the Summer Olympics, it is it uh, we we got a couple of uh, golds in sprinting, you know. We do, <laughs> but they're always Jamaican board. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny if you look at that. Uh, Michael Johnson's parents are Jamaican. Carl yep. Lewis's parents are Jamaican. Limford Christie uh, from England, uh, Jamaican. Jamaican. So there's there's a great there's a great documentary done by Michael Johnson on what it is about jamaica and why they have the fastest times uh in the 200 100 in both the men and women's out, out yeah. of this small out of this small small island so um, yeah. i would i well, would you challenge f- you to watch it it's pretty you, cool you, you forgot two names ben johnson and donovan bailey of course yeah that, that goes without saying so all jamaican like yeah. just jamaican everywhere right yeah jamaican it's probably the uh robert nesta marley music <laughs> so you are um you've coached a lot of people and you're coaching a lot of people. You name dropped a couple, um, which obviously the creme de la creme. You coached Tiger Woods for four years. Uh, we're going to talk about that. But here's my thing. I think you should take me on as a client because he only charges 5% of their winnings. Yeah, so be, I get free, free, free you coaching. You have to cut out a little bit of the trophy <laughs> to hand over. <laughs> uh, so how's it going? Yeah, everything's good. I, I haven't seen Ben in a long time, but Ben Ben was one of the first uh, pros that I got to know out there because Ben used to play uh, with Stephen Ames uh, yeah. from time to time. Um, ben appreciated Stephen. I think a lot of guys misunderstood Stephen, but he's he's a good dude. But you, you got to kind of get it. Uh, <laughs> well, he's from Trinidad, get, right? So yeah, let's be honest. I, he's I, and I Canadian. Probably known, he's I probably know Trinidad. Ben for. I think I've probably known Ben for six, probably 16 years now. So, and then yeah. obviously with Herbie and John Mills and all the Kent State boys, uh, Ryan Yip, uh, Kent State and Canada have a, a, a lot in common. So Ben probably for many times in his life was just surrounded by Canadians. <laughs> He's surrounded by I one was, right I'm now. S- surrounded by one now. <laughs> <laughs> two of them, actually. You, you got two. one on the computer. You're always Canadian. Oh. Did you ever look at Kent State or do they ever look at you playing? No. No, I wasn't. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't good enough to go to Kent State. Well, it's funny. You got a. You've got something in common with Mike Weir. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I don't. I don't know if I would have went to BYU. I probably would have been kicked out real quick. So. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I don't know what he's getting to is Herb didn't offer him a scholarship. Like, oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I think he was going to be what he said when we had Mike, we had Mike on earlier. He said, yeah, we, I was going to BYU anyway. So it, I don't think well, it, it mattered. I, you know, things like that with Mike, you know, they just added a little bit to that chip and that's where that greatness came from. Right. I'll show you yeah. the, the yeah. little lefty from Canada. So, yeah. Yeah. Who's actually right-handed. Same with Phil Mickelson. Mickelson's right. Is Mickelson, Mickelson's right-handed too. So from uh, since you obviously coach at a very high level, I guess why if you're right-handed, why would you play left-handed? I guess like what advantages do they have? Well, I mean, basically, Strong. if you're if you're a right-handed golfer, the right-handed person playing left-handed, um, it's not to say. The, the hand that you use all the time might not be the stronger hand. It might just be the hand that's used for uh, the minimal stuff more often, things that would deal with uh, like coordination, so to speak. So in hockey, in Canada, in hockey, a lot of guys are right-handed people, but they learn to play hockey left. And so oh, shit, that's me. This is the, that. that's the stick control hand. Yep. And then this is kind of the power hands for the most part um, in the golf swing. If you were a, a right-handed person, but left-handed hitter in the golf swing, both opposite sides of the body do different things. So this would be the lead side in a left-handed swing. It's a puller and a rotator and the left side would be, is more of a pusher and a cover. So you, you will see there's, there's quite a few PGA tour players who play right-handed, but they're left-handed people. Um, so really about getting the club to release properly is really about having this union between the left and the right sides. Like I said, one side's pulling, one side's pushing, getting them to do that when they're responsible to create a release in front of you. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, um, do you coach any left-handers? I mean, most of you guys are all, I mean, there's not many of them anyway, but. Well, I remember when I was, when I was teaching in Canada before I moved here, I, like half our junior program was lefties. I, re- I remember parents having a hard time buying equipment, yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> literally, like literally buying equipment. And uh, yeah. I wonder how many kids probably started that way. And then someone just said, no, you stand like this. Okay. Um, I've, well, converted, like- I've converted a few people in golf schools and stuff where they, they just couldn't contemplate hitting it that way. So I, I at the, it's kind of, you save it for the last, but, the next day you bring out left-handed seven iron and yeah. nine times out of 10, when you do that, you get like dramatic improvement. It's like, <laughs> you play left-handed. Yeah. No, just, just yeah. when, like I've seen a Dollars. billion, I've seen a billion swings, but sometimes there's just nothing matching. And then you got to yeah. think, all right, this person is probably not right-handed. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think what, I think why a lot of people start left-handed because they watch their dad or their favorite player and they kind of mimic them. So when they're taking it back right-handed, they're taking it back left-handed, right? They're going the same direction, they think. You know what I mean? Mm. So they're watching a mirror image. They're, you know, I, I think that's why. But could, I, mean, I could, could be wrong. No, it could, could, it could be, but I think that uh, um, you'll see certain players who pull more and certain players who push mm. more. I would say a big kind of pushing player would be a Woosnam and a big pulling player would be like BJ. So if you look at BJ, I mean – his right hand actually comes off the club at impact. So that's right. how hard he's releasing it, but that's how much this is responsible for everything. Pull on. Yeah. So that's very interesting. Do you know that? No, that's really interesting. <laughs> so we'll learn something today. So how'd you get in the? I mean, I know you started up in Canada, like how it just, so wait, so where's he from? From Burlington. Let's no sit again. Ontario. No. What, where's, what town's he from? <laughs> Burlington. 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 Is that where the Coke company Who? came from? Who? No. Uh, not the Burlington Co Factory. <laughs> <laughs> That's pure jokes right yeah. now. So how what what uh what made you get into coaching? I think more than anything, like getting out of university, obviously didn't have that good of school marks. Um <laughs> it, it's the it's the reason that I knew I probably wouldn't have made it at BYU is because I hardly made it at TSU. So um Basically was com- like literally got fired one day from Springhouse Golf and Country Club. If you remember, it's part of the Gaylord Entertainment. Um, 
Vanderbilt and Tennessee State used to practice there. So I was working in the summers in the back shop. And I guess I'd come in late again. And so they asked me, they asked me to leave. Uh, could have been, could have been for a number of altercations. I just can't really remember. It's a long time ago, Ben. Um, and I was walking out from the cart barn up the, the hill into the parking lot uh, for what seemed like the last time. And this guy came down with this sign um, said, said, said John Jacobs golf school. So he introduced himself as Mark said he was the director of instruction at the club. Now uh, they're running go John Jacobs golf schools there for like five or six months. Where should, where should I put the stuff? I said, look, I just got fired. So I, I don't know where to tell you to put it. <laughs> and then he, he offered me a job uh, putting, putting like the pyramids together and taking the food orders, making sure everyone had water and then taking the videos and setting up the VHS VCR player where the coach would come in and draw with a Sharpie on the screen. Um, now, before that, I'd already likened myself pretty knowledgeable about the golf swing. It was, uh, if I was on Ben's team at Kent State, he might have partied with me, but he definitely wouldn't have golfed with me because he would have been like, are you actually still talking about the golf swing? Um, so I was already kind of super fascinated by that point. While everyone else was shooting scores, I was looking through golf instruction books. And so when I started with them, I did that uh, for a few weeks, waited tables at the, at, at, in the evening because 25 bucks a day isn't going to cut it. <laughs> and uh, I got really lucky that I think I had the talents at it. And then uh, one time, like Jacobs runs their golf schools all over the country. And so they normally have like a host pro who's, he's always there, but they like, will have visiting pros come in and these guys just go all over the country. And basically you teach, then you play nine holes with the group and then you have a happy hour after and, and dinner. So yeah. I was 22 or whatever. And so most of it I liked, <laughs> except the fact that I wasn't getting paid. So we had, we had, a, it, we had an issue happen one time. And the main guy couldn't do it. So I was forced like in my fifth or sixth week doing it to, to put the boards up, hit all the shots, explain what the board said, and then run the whole thing. Um, and I did an excellent job. And then from there, they hired me on as an instructor probably six weeks into it. Uh, so I wasn't the ball bitch anymore. <laughs> the ball uh, bitch. I wasn't going to be the ball bitch for very long. Uh, we'll put it like that, <laughs> yeah. right? Especially when I heard the things the instructors were saying. And I'm like, that's not accurate or even correct. So um, then I went to Florida and did the same thing with the Jacob schools back to Nashville, back to Florida, and then lost my visa in 99, uh, to work in America and told the guys at Jacobs at head office that I think they should invest in me. Cause I'm, I'm going to be a pretty big deal in golf instruction. And they kind of giggled and said, good luck. And that was it. So I drove back to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. yeah look, la they're la who's laughing now, right? Yeah. Hey, you know what? It's, it's, uh, I was an arrogant little prick. I mean, I think Ben probably remembers when we first met. I've definitely been humbled by the game by 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 now. But uh, you, you made a big mistake. But that's though. what makes you know. I think that's yeah. what makes you successful, right? Because you 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 know what you're good at, right? And so it's just like Poulter, right? Same thing. Like he's very cocky, but he knows and he has that self belief, and that's what all successful people do, right? They have that self belief. And, you know, you're no different than anybody, right? No, I, mean, you're, sure. <laughs> you know. I don't, I don't, I don't think, I, I don't think anybody has ever got more, more dollar per talent percentage than Ian Poulter. Right. Especially at the Ryder Cup. I mean, it's just a beast. So is like, that what you're saying about yourself then, Sean? <laughs> you got more well, no. money for per. No, what he's saying is he's not I'm charging enough. Yeah. He needs to charge more. No. no, you made a big mistake. Okay. And I should have taught you this. You should have married an American. I'm just kidding. Well, he's no, in Florida, but I good. think that's, he's okay. Well, no, he's doing okay. I'm, he's fine. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm good. We, we, my wife is, uh, she's from Toronto and Vancouver, but we, uh, yeah. we got after all the years we've been here on different visas and green cards, we were just uh, given uh, dual citizenship. Oh, nice. There you go. There you go. Nice. Big time. They're just get, they just gave it to you. <laughs> Must be nice. Just gave it to you. Didn't have to apply. Well, it probably just took it to what twenty years. Right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. It's 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 yeah. It's it takes. It's a long process, which I can. Uh, oh God, it's I'll, it's yeah. amazing. 
I'll but say I had no idea. My wife did everything. So, but but you, but you know what's amazing? Okay, I have two degrees from two American universities. I was born, grew up in Oakville. You grew up in Burlington, so you're a little bit closer than me to the border by maybe what 10, 15 minutes. But the hoops you have to go through. I mean, he grew up probably like what fifty minutes from Niagara Falls. I grew up maybe mm-hmm. 55, 58 minutes, whatever it is. But mm-hmm. and he went to uni- university. You did hopefully graduate. Um, and if Barely, you that's, yeah. so, that's cool. That's all right. Don't worry about it. But um, it's amazing the hoops you have to go to to get that, you know, visa, permanent residence. Well, especially like especially after 9-11. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's where it all changed dramatically. I mean, I remember before that we used to go over to Buffalo all the time um, and show our driver's license. We didn't have to show our passport. Yeah. yeah. I never got to Buffalo. We just stopped at the Sundowner. I be- yeah, I bet you did. Yeah. <laughs> You don't know what the sundowner is. I do. <laughs> really? Yeah, he, he, he played um, in the he played in the party cup. The party cup, yeah. The party. But cup? They call it. They, they call it the party, party cup. cup now, Ben. All the young kids call it the party cup. Yeah, the but they don't cup. party though. That's the problem. Well, they they probably think a Red Bull in Call of Duty is party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's very true. <laughs> no, spend a couple hours and what's it? Sundowner? Yeah. The sundowner, sundowner. Yeah, yeah. A couple hours there. Yeah. So 99, you moved back to Canada, right? Was yeah. That 99. Yeah. So seven years. What, is that when you, you start teaching right away or did you do something yeah. else? No, that it was winter when I got back. So there was no job. So I had six months of driving a forklift from eight at night till two in the morning to remind me why oh. I didn't want to do that. Um, the money was decent, but I, I'm not quite made <laughs> out for that. Uh, I, and then living back with my mom and dad too. So ambition hit me like a, a tsunami yeah. um went back to waiting tables again that was always easy though i used to work at the keg i'm sure you've eaten at the keg oh yeah uh, the keg. no i never have no <laughs> never eaten the keg yeah you look like a vegetable guy eh? yeah. oh, an oh. <laughs> yeah, i, I only eat at good places i've never eaten at the keg <laughs> i know there's a keg actually there's a keg right down the street from uh glen abbey that i worked there yes yeah correct did you really yes you bet yeah, right, so, right near Filthy McNasty's. Yeah, I've been, been there a couple of times, too. That was actually a sports and uh, a, a, a sports and pool hall grill for anyone yeah. who got dismayed by the name of Filthy McNasty. So, yes, yes. we uh, basically that was kind of my world. It was like Glen Abbey to either the keg to work or to Filthy McNasty's to go meet with the other guys in my academy and uh, watch Tiger every Sunday because he was winning every Sunday. And yep. uh you know, attempt to uh, meet meet people. <laughs> <laughs> so, what made you decide to go to Florida? Like, just, just had Not enough a- of the winter. No, I yeah. mean, yeah, I, I definitely don't like that. Um, I love Canada, but not the weather in the winter. Um, I, I mean, I wanted to coach at the highest level. I already had like quite a few players on the Canadian tour that I've been working with during that time around 2001. I kind of put my focus more to like uh, elite juniors and and golf with a little bit higher level. And naturally, I had guys, you know, Derek Gillespie, Brian McCann, all those. I worked with every single one of those guys. Um, Mark Henderson, you name it. So 2000. Five, I started traveling on the Hooters tour a little bit with uh, a couple of Aussies I coached. Um, So I just kind of liked it. And so I knew that considering in America, they probably don't know in most cases we have a prime minister. They weren't going to know about some golf coach uh, up in Toronto. So decided to got a visa, which was difficult to get, got a visa. uh, Probably the only way I was going to get it as an investor visa working for a company who started a golf academy for kids. Uh, uh, down Canadian kids in America rather than them going to Ledbetter or Haney. Uh, we just thought, why not do our own? Uh, and that was 2006. And then November of 2006, uh, that's when I got a call from Stephen Ames. So he was your first big time. How did, did, did you know him or did he, yeah, did he I, knew I knew somebody who worked? I knew him because I was the head coach of the Canadian Junior Golf Associations, like uh, their elite teams. So okay. Stephen, one time brought the top kids from Trinidad up to play the Canadian kids. So I met Steven. He just did a clinic one time and I just okay. met him. Briefly. Um, and I, I remember I met him cause I disagreed with what he was saying in his clinic about the swing. So, <laughs> <laughs> 
So that I don't think he I don't think he initially liked me, but I think I left a mark. And then when he hurt his back, uh, Canadian chiropractor Craig Davies, who's my roommate on tour for now 16 years, um, he helped him out and then told him he thought it was mechanical. And Craig and I, our work relationship goes back to 2001 when I really started like looking under the hood at the body and anatomy and biomechanics and like what's actually happening versus all these different articles that were giving me different reasons that things were happening. Um, and so that we, I just lucked out that I was kind of in Steven's memory and then Craig had told him about me and then he called me and said, I'll give you uh, three days. If you can help the discomfort in my back and get me hitting it better, then we'll start working. And he came down, it was a piece of cake. Uh, Steven was already so good. Like, I mean, he just won the players championship like a few months before that, but then hurt his back at the end of the summer. Um, and so here you got a guy who's like known as a ball striker who's coming to you. Um, but, you know, at the top of his, his wrist was bowed, which I'm a fan of. I wouldn't change it if you do it, but a bowed wrist with a high left arm is always going to lead into a player going backwards through the ball. So over time, we just flattened his swing out a little bit so he could rotate more and not have to bend back and catch it like this. Um, and when we were great, you know, he, he, uh, he went on to have never have back surgery or anything like that. We had a great relationship for many, many years. Um, and, you know, without that call that day, who knows? Who, who knows? I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure I would have still found my way to what I thought I was supposed to. But to be that young, and I was so young versus, and I also looked like I was 18. So you still do. You see, I know you <laughs> aged well. <laughs> we're about to, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're sneaking up on 50, aren't we, Ben? So oh, yeah, I hear you. Uh, yeah, to be, you know, to be with someone like a Stephen Ames and to be, you know, trusted with helping him, um, you know, whether or not people like loved or didn't like Stephen, uh, I think everyone respected his game and the quality of a player that he was. So, I mean, that was unbelievable advertising. And then Stephen was really close with Sean O'Hara. They both kind of had similar stories with their dads. And, and so he, he kind of took Sean under his wing a little bit. And so we used to play practice rounds a little bit with, you know, Ben or Sean, and then Sean started hitting snap hooks and for a couple months. And then he, he asked me to help him. Um, Sean just, you know, Sean kind of grew up watching Davis love and he used to have these high hands, but even he'd, he'd have to, the problem is when you have to fit the hands in on the way down, they're, they're not able to go to some place. They have to fit into some place. And that normally goes against how you, how you're moving. So I literally, I remember I put Sean in bare feet at Glen Abbey, put a glove under his right arm and told him not to slip and don't let the glove fall out. And then that week he hit 86% of his fairways and 88% of his greens. And we lost by one stroke to, uh, who was it? Ches Revy, I think. Um, okay. And then two weeks later, Sean's good friend, Hunter Mahan asked for help. So, I mean, it, that's just how it is. The right? snowballs. That, yeah. yeah. It, it's, it snowballs and it snowballs, you know, Right around the time where I started with Tiger, I had Justin Rose, Sean, and Hunter, and I'd helped. I mean, they were all going to get there at some point, but I'd helped them pretty quickly all to get into the top 10 in the world. And that was, I, to me, I was just doing my job. I, I worked with so many good players in Canada that didn't understand that the bar closes at two. That means you leave at 10 PM. So yeah. <laughs> I, I'd, I mean, how many skilled guys have been up there? I mean, right. insane. Right. So, you know, around that time, the phone is agents and people calling all the time. And then after I got fired by a tiger, that phone goes quiet. Right. So <laughs> what I think, I think what you recognize as a coach, especially in an individual sport, I don't know if it's so much true with team sports where you have more, I, I would love to be able to go out and walk the golf course with my players on Sunday. I, I don't right. think that that would ever hurt. Um, that would even be, even though Herb's not like a technical coach, the fact that you could have had him out on the weekends with you, helping you kind of get executing properly and connect to where you're at and not being in your head about a million things. Right. You, you don't, it's not really coaching, right? In golf, it's not, and it ain't really instruction. Like, what are you going to instruct Justin Rose what to do? It's like, right. it's Justin Rose. So it falls into technique, obviously. And then, you know, being a mentor and helping guide these guys to see how good they are. Uh, you're not doing anything to them. You're just kind of showing them what, what they, 
what they didn't understand. So I think you realize that your career is going to be based on the positions and lives that all these guys are in. So you, you're going with a player, you get to the top in the world, you're playing great all the time. Player has two babies. Next thing you know, you're 40th <laughs> in the world. You don't seem to be doing a whole lot different. Looks the same on video. All the track man numbers are the same, right. not scoring the same. So I think you realize over time that your success is going to be based on really how clear and focused other people are. But because when, when you're not clear and focused, uh, you know, if you don't have a top 10 talent, then golf is going to be hard all the time. And it's hard and it's hard anyways, right. period. So yeah, that, I think that's kind of how I see it. I've been pretty fortunate well, to be out there for 16 years. I still, uh, I still enjoy doing it. Um, I think the day I will know I don't enjoy it is if everyone I'm coaching is playing well and I still don't want to be there. Uh, right. when I, when I feel like that, sometimes I think about there's a couple of players who aren't playing that well. So I just sometimes have to convince myself that the pain is worth it. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, you brought up a lot of good points and I think, you know, I read something where you said you got to, you learn what you got to teach everybody differently. Not everybody's yeah. the same, but like you've mentioned, like just with Sean O'Hare, like it's probably a big flaw, but he was so talented. He was still able to play at a high level and just that little tweak, which is a major change <laughs> to the average person. They probably don't see the big difference. And then, and also like I started working with the kids, like similar way you do, obviously not to the level, but you know, it's up to them. Like you could give them the greatest teaching in the world. It's up to the play. Right. And like you said, like you got a guy that goes from first in the world to 40 because they have a couple of kids. It all looks the same, but they're like you say, it's in the mind, right? They just don't want it as bad. Maybe they got other priorities. Yeah. You know what they're I think not it is? putting the work in whatever. I just think it's like the greats of all time. I think they've sacrificed more than everybody else. I think it it comes down to that a little bit, like, you know, the amount of times that on his pond in Brantford that Wayne Gretzky had frostbite or hypothermia, like he just wanted, (laughs) he just, he just wanted to keep skating and playing and playing and playing. So, you know, they, a lot of these greats, they kind of miss their childhoods, you know, they, they miss the, this things that they struggle with as they get older. Um, I just think that people making excuses, they just don't want it bad enough. I think that that's, because you don't really hear excuses from the greats, you know? So I think that it's difficult too. uh, golf being such a difficult game. And every year these new players coming up and at a younger age, I mean, look, they've got, a, what is it now? Yeah. The top, the top five or 10 players in college go directly to the web. Yeah. Well, how many top, how many top college players missed out at web school by one and the next year at PGA right. tour Q school by one, just, the timing so you can see they're even yeah. trying to make it easier for these young great players to get on to the tour because obviously of the brand and uh the high level of play right. right now so like when you bring when you have these kids i mean like i have a belief that you know i played at a high level when i was five years old up until you know i was in my mid-30s and then i just lost it right you kind of see that a little bit with tiger in a way right mm-hmm. and I, I know maybe his wasn't necessarily strictly mentally it might have been physically right it's so, everything right it's everything. so with these kids right i love seeing kids that play other multiple sports yeah and then they're multi they're good at all these sports and then they come in and then they as they get in the high school they start gearing towards you know playing that one sport and i think that's the wave of the future i don't know if you think the same thing yep. if it's there's too much emphasis on you're eight years old you got to be number one in the world of golf yeah but that's every but that's every sport now. right but it's, i'm saying it's crazy it's ruined it's kind of ru- and i think especially in golf when you're on your own and you're out there it's, right it's i don't know what your thoughts on that yeah i mean how many kids who are how many kids when they say they want to be a pro golfer at 10 are saying it for the same reason as the 10 year olds who say they want to be a dentist, like right. what 10 year old was ever like, <laughs> Oh, I I'd love to be, sure. I think I'd love to be an accountant. <laughs> right. So I, I think that, and I've wondered from time to time too, on the PGA tour, if you were to just grab everybody one day and be on the range and say, okay, here's the deal. 
Um, you got to give in your clubs at the end of the week. I guarantee you that financially you'll be fine for the rest of your life, but you have to quit golf. It'd be interesting, right? Yeah. It, oh yeah. <laughs> I, and people, people who play golf, who love watching pro golf, couldn't even imagine that, but they just, everything always looks better when you haven't seen it yet. And so it, you know, yeah, it's a great life. Ben, Ben and I have been fortunate to travel all over the world. Um, met a lot of great people, but you know, being away constantly from your family. And in my case, I have four players. So one's doing great. One's decent. The other one's okay. And the other one's terrible. It's, it doesn't stop. So it's, it's, I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the challenge as much as any of it. Um, I don't have many bad days, but by that, by no means means that it's, uh, that is easy. And I think with the influx of money into it, it's becoming even more and more competitive. I mean, I've yeah. met in, in the last five years and I think I ushered in some of this when it came to like measuring things and using data. Um, but it's amazing. The people who come in out now with different ideas and how they can uh, help players and almost none of it refers to practice at all. It's like, it's all, it's kind of this whole look at the whole athlete more than right than anything else but you know what it, 16 years ago and to this day the if you watch the guys that are up at the leaderboard the most they seem to be the most organized they seem to have good people around them um they seem to have a nice freedom about how they go about what they do is i mean imagine like john rom just had to basically say hey, i'm sorry but i'm not going to dubai because of this this and this back in the day you didn't have to make a comment or let anybody right. know that but you know, there's sponsors, there's all these other things. And people can't imagine, like, he's a young man. He plays golf. He flies on a private jet. How could he be so burnt out from the game? And it's like, I don't think it stops. Like, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't leave. I don't leave. I, I was with Lydia Co last week on Wednesday and I've been working with Lydia for a year. And Ben, she's just like as special as you get at playing golf. Right. I mean, she can just play golf, but I mean, she, we sit there in a practice round and she's into the grain on an uphill line. She just keeps duffing it. Right. And she giggles that she can't chip when it doesn't matter. And then from the same place, uh, from the same place in the tournament round, she hits this didn't even look like she touched the ground and hit this low spinner that drew towards the hole. Right. It's, right. it's like she can only <laughs> she can actually only do certain things in competition. She can't do them in practice. It's like that's some that's that's some baby goat stuff, but we were on the range uh, Wednesday and then we went on the course and she just come from Saudi Arabia. Uh, she's only 24, but that's a long flight and jet lag is a real thing, especially right. physiologically speaking. So I find after long flights like that, I'm always like very careful about looking at a player's posture, just these minimal things that can little change thing. just a little bit, right. but those, those it, when, when you have 2 million dominoes, the, the smallest thing to happen is the first domino hits the second domino. So right. small things gone, you know, unseen become massive problems. So I, uh, Justin Rose once referred to me as the, um, as the most expensive standing coach in the world. <laughs> and, Cause I'm so, I'm, I just, when you have all my, all my friends are all Kairos and stuff. So it, it's, they just think it's standing, but I'm really looking at all these interactions between the body. And it, it's, so it's a lot more than just standing, but. Well, it's like, when I'm, well, it's like the, the, the ladies that um, was it Mia, the girls out in uh, club 54 or vision 54 uh, yeah, Marriott Lynn. Lynn and that, I mean, but it's more, it's about knowing like what they notice about great players is they understand what their body is doing and understand awareness and very aware. Right. So it's like I've done that or traveled across the world and played in events and felt awful, like tired just all day. Right. And then have energy at night just because of time change or whatever, but uh -huh. still manage to play really well. Right. <laughs> so no, you can't be, it can't, it can't be an excuse, but it was like, we, we went out, I met her on the fifth hole. She's just won by five at this, at any level now in golf, <laughs> that's by a hundred. Right. Um, she's, at one point she was 16 under through 28 holes on the weekend. Like, how did you, how does one do that? Right. Yeah. So, um, but I noticed watching last week, like the fairways were pretty big over there and um, she can go lights out with a putter and then she can be lights out with wedges and short irons. But 
I filmed a bunch of stuff on the television that I didn't like. And so when we got it, she might've hit it to five feet, but that's not what we're working on. So right. <laughs> what makes her so great is that when she gets on the course, it's not about any of that anymore. It's about making a score. So she's got pure freedom to do that, but we do have kind of a blueprint of what we've been working on to uh, improve distance and accuracy and all these things. And, and we're doing a good job with it. And so on Wednesday, uh, sorry, Tuesday evening, we went out in the course and she hit like eight snap hooks in a row. Um, it just wasn't hitting it good. And so I just said to myself, you know what? She's, there's a good chance she's tired, whether she's going to admit it or not, doesn't matter. Um, she just won. That takes a lot out of you. Right. And I'm not really seeing it very clearly right now. So I feel sometimes when I get like insecure and it's just like momentary, uh, I try to start fixing things. And I tend to cause more harm than good in that moment. Yeah. So as soon as I realize I want to fix something, I just go quiet now. It took me years to learn that. Um, and then I went to this bar right by my hotel, sat down, had dinner and a couple of beers and looked at her videos again. And it was just like bingo. So went the next day and her caddy was shocked, Ben, because he thought it was like a real technical session for someone who had just won. But I tried to get him to understand that I don't that's last week. I don't even care about that. Right. Like that. It's not time to be like, oh, we won. Now let's just cruise and have a fun week. It's never about that. It's about. Right. And so we got. We got to uh, I did some stuff with how her pelvis was in her setup and then how she turned into the bones in her right leg. Everyone talks about the hips too much. They don't talk about the bones enough. Uh, and then right away, it was like, boom, that's it. Um, and she went on to lose in the playoff yesterday, but I think missed like two fairways in the last 45 holes. So coming where she came from, where she literally had a two-way miss at 92 miles an hour, which is, I, I can see a two-way miss at 130, but right. I found more enjoyment out of her hitting every single fairway than I did out of her winning a tournament. I, that That's because she can, she can do that. She's just amazing. Right. So this right. is, to me, it's all about getting slightly better uh, and what that looks like. Well, but it's sometimes a progression, a process, right? I mean, totally. <laughs> I mean, you work with a lot of kids, you know, high school kids. I'm like, listen, your swing today is going to be different tomorrow. And then five years down the road. So yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah. you know, you don't need to go from shooting 80 to 60, right. You just got to no. gradually get a little bit better. Yeah. I, I agree. I agree with that. I would say that the peak, of course, we have these young guys who come up now, Ben, and they win majors like in their first 12 months or whatever. But yeah. uh, and that could still be rare. It might not happen again for five more years or 10 more years. But we are definitely seeing a lot more young names up top the leaderboard. I think one COVID has something to do with that, because I think for guys who were kind of used to their system and how they traveled with their families or how they did okay. it as soon as the quarantine came, it was a different thing. Right. Guys used to come in Tuesday evening. Then we were coming in Monday to get tested. So it, but for those other guys, it still ended up being Chipotle in their room of call of duty till 1am. Right? right. Like they did. <laughs> it, 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 it didn't change, but, but I would still say that the, the prime years I think are probably 28 to 34 is if, yeah. if I think if you looked at everybody. Yeah, I think if you look back, that's probably when everybody played their best, right? <laughs> Six year span, it's going to be within that. That's crazy. You you want to say something? And then Bernard this is Langer. the quietest you've ever. This is the quietest Luke has ever been. By the and way. then Bernard Longer wins the <laughs> Charles Schwab Cup at sixty four years old. Right. I mean, how how crazy is that? That's like maybe one of the craziest things that's ever happened in sports. It just doesn't yeah. even fifty and sixty four is like is the difference between a ten and a thirty year old. I mean, that's just right. amazing. Yeah, and I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, those guys can still play. That's the great thing. It's not, it's not they're like they're shooting 80. I mean, they're still shooting 15, 20 under par every week. There's hope for you. Yeah. There's How old are you now, Ben? There's, I'm 44. 44? Do you have any thoughts of the no. senior tour? None. None. Zero. I can't even break 80 right now. If I, try. Oh, I, I think I played like whatever. seven rounds, eight rounds this year. What was your at scoring average? I don't know. I, I was picking up half the hole. <laughs> but it's just like when I want to try, I can do okay. But it's just, Yeah, exactly. You know, but must, I, it's be, still, must, must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, just, nice. I lost it. Or 
kids are playing golf now, so that's more fun watching. Them. Oh, right on. Yeah. So yeah. All right, we're just going to take a quick commercial break. What Rob- I do is yeah, I got to do my little spiel here quickly. Quickly, Robert Keenan Winery, located in the historic Spring Mountain district of the Napa Valley, celebrate the best round you ever had, or get over your sorrows after the snowman on number eighteen. Drown yourself in one of the fourteen thousand cases per year they produce. Combine the dedication of experienced winemakers with a commitment to excellence. The Robert Keenan Winery has distinguished itself as a maker of exceptional wines and limited varietals in quantity. Wines for sipping, wines for enjoying, wines for enhancing any occasion. In the last eight vintages, 42 wines have been rated between 90 and 97 points by Robert Parker Jr. As a special thank you, use code clubs and corks, all uppercase, and receive 20% off your next order with Keenan Winery. They are golfers just like me and me. So <laughs> you had Tiger Woods for four years. What's the biggest thing you learned from coaching probably the greatest golfer ever? Oh, uh, I you've probably never been asked that before. <laughs> No, there, there's probably about 8,000 qu- answers. Um, What's one? What's one that you kind of see yourself maybe utilizing when you're working with Lydia Ko or a Justin Rose or, you know, a Danny Willett? Probably just to be sure that I don't overcoach any of them. Um, I think that, uh, yeah, I think I neglected I think I obviously neglected the fact that it was Tiger Woods more often than I, than I should have. And, and just in the sense that, you know, when I started with him, it was like a very difficult time for him in his life. Like it was, was the biggest fall from grace we've seen in right. our lifetime, really. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, yeah, I just, I just, I just think that, you know, I was too method driven at that time still and thought I knew what was right. So, but what I learned from Tiger the most was just, just watching him practice, just the, just the level of concentration that he had, the fact that he wasn't out there for any other reason except to learn. Um, I was often told to stop talking. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, Did he just, just flat out tell you to stop talking? Ish. Uh, but no, no, I get, I, I get it. It, it. it was, it was different, right? Like my other yeah. guys, my other guys, they get coached up. They love it. We, that's what we do. And Tiger was really just, you know, I, I think he, he was just obviously looking for someone to help him. Um, and I think we, you know, I think we did a, a good job in the sense of like our friendship and that, I always had his back and there's nothing on print of me ever saying anything about him. There's nothing like that at all. Uh, well, I heard he likes to pass gas on the golf course. <laughs> right. He, but he just, just kind of how we went about right. it. it. It was, it was difficult. Like I, I came into his life when everyone else was leaving. And yeah. so yeah. it was a tough place to be. I mean, he, he, by then I'm sure he wasn't very good at handing out trust. And so it, it was difficult, but it was, it was amazing. It was, uh, it was incredible, but you know, I got, I have some of my younger players like Sam Horsfield and Cameron champ. I have them trying to hit a full basket of wedges and short irons without taking a divot. I learned that from tiger. Um, I have them trying to, how do you do that? It's doable. It's, it's doable. doable. Norman used to do it. Really? Yeah. It, yeah, Norman picked the ball almost, right? I mean, he brushed the grass. Yeah, and T- Tiger Tiger would take divots, but just he just felt as a practice for sequence and rhythm that it was really important. Um, you know, the idea how he used to sit there on the range and make full swings and hit the ball like 10 different distances. So he, he never really shortened his swing to hit the ball right. shorter. He kept the length in his swing and gave him time to accelerate however much he needed to uh, – needed to do. So he was the best ever when he was in between numbers and by in between numbers, I mean, when you get a yardage in the fairway and say you hit your six iron 195 and your seven 178, you know, you've got 184. And so it's not really seven. It's not really six. So do you hit seven extra hard or do you take a little off of six? And I think that taking off was is very difficult to do uh because there's there's almost like less commitment to the move and just how he learned to do that i think that his ability to be pin high from not having a good number in the fairway was better than anyone else and 
you know, you can see around Matt Wolf played with Justin Rose the other day and Matt, I think he shot 10 under and he literally had like nine or 10 iron shots where he was able to back foot it, hit it past the pin, spin it back to like this. Whereas Two weeks before that in Vegas, Danny Willett hit the first eight fairways of the first 10 or 11 holes uh, and was one under and was playing beautiful, but was in between clubs every single shot. Right. Uh, so it looks like a one under. It doesn't look that good. But the fact is, it just it's a lot easier to do something full out than it is to be a little more delicate with it. I think that that's where he I think that was his greatest skill was his ability to control the trajectory and distance his irons went. And he he did a lot of different things right. with it. And I, I mean, we practiced a little bit together when he was with uh, Hank, you know, and Hank would come in and we'd get together a little bit, but that was the one thing I noticed. He would be not be afraid to practice something that was maybe weird, controversial or different. Right. And I grew up and my grandfather said, I want you, when you practice, practice stuff or distances that you normally would not have. Right. So if it, let's say you hit a pitching wedge 130, right. Well, don't practice hitting at 130. You know, you can hit at 130. Like you were mentioned before, practice hitting at 120 or 135 or, you know what I mean? Practice different distances. So when you get on the court, you're never going to have just 130, right? Yeah. I mean, imagine, imagine, a, imagine into the wind pitching wedge to a back pin and you're able to hit that pitching wedge 97 yards. I mean, it's, right. it's, it's just going to get so much closer than anything with more spin. You know what I mean? Right. So yeah. he would do stuff like that. I remember watching him at the British Open at Muirfield one year and the first like six or seven groups went through there and they were all kind of in the same part of the fairway and they're coming up 20 yards short. They're just all kinds of stuff. And you can see the ball on the camera standing up and he had like 150 to a right pin and hit this kind of 10 yard fade with a six iron. Uh, his arms looked like they were hardly moving and this thing came out and went in there to about 20 feet and he literally got a standing ovation from the crowd because no one had got pin high yet. Like yeah. nobody <laughs> hitting it close was going to be a miracle, but yeah. just to think that this guy's from California and I'd watch him on the Lynx golf and think, okay, he lived before and grew up on a Lynx course, like just the amazing ability to adapt to the environment and play the whole, how the hole was being asked to be played. Um, He's made more good pars than anyone alive, you know? Yeah. Well, especially from a guy who was a power player too, right? That you would think today that bomb driver and overpower it, but he thought his way around the golf. Course. Oh yeah. No, yeah. we, we, he never gets enough credit for, he had less unforced errors than anyone in golf. And if you look at the great players in tennis, they don't have more winners than anyone else. They just make less unforced errors. Um, right. I think it, at the at the at the highest yes, level of that. golf, it's it's not about birdies. It's about how few bogeys you make because you're not on the PGA Tour because you can't make birdies. Right. That's interesting. How, how do you decide? Or how I guess how do you do it all? How do you decide how many? I mean, is there a certain number of players on the pro tour that you coach? I mean, like if you know if there's five, you could get rid of one. You bring in a new one. Like how does that work with everything else? Your academies, life you know, having a family and kids and stuff like that. How do you balance all that? Yeah. It's kind of like a controlled chaos in a, in a sense. It's, it's kind uh, of like us. We're controlled chaos. Yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. I, I think, I think the key is just to wherever you're at is just to be present where you're at. So, I mean, you know, I've been to, uh, I've been, I haven't been to many as many basketball or football games as my buddies, but when I'm there, I'm not on my phone, you know, while I'm watching my kids play. So I think it's about, it's just about being present. Obviously my wife has been undeniable. And the reason that this has all happened made it very easy to be me, uh, super organized. I'm represented by Wasserman sports. Um, they do all my business stuff. So I, I don't really have to do much that way, except just show up and be myself. So most of the time I still spend is just coaching, um, Co coaching that way and not really getting not getting I've had a couple moments where I got torn in too many directions and it just to me it's like it doesn't matter how it looks like you're doing it matters how you feel like you're doing and for me when I'm half into something it just doesn't feel right so it's either all in or not in at all and 
So I think now that, you know, I've got my players on tour for all these years, um, I still, you know, I still enjoy that. One day will I ride off into the sunset and do golf schools and all that type of stuff. I'm sure I'll do all that, but I'm just, I guess I'm lucky to not really wake up and think about how to make, like, what do I need to do to make another dollar? I don't equate my career with, with, with that part of it. Um, it brings um, you back to I, the, ke- it brings you back to the keg days, huh? I was enjoying it then. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was, I was oh. having a good, I was yeah. having a good time then. So. Right. That's amazing. So how, I guess, how do you, um, like, is each player that you have on the tour a different level of commitment per se, or is no. it pretty much? No. So no, how much will you work with them individually? It just, it, it just depends. Like Lydia lives here in Orlando. Ben on lives here in Orlando. Um, Sam Horsfield lives here in Orlando. Um, I think the future really is not on the road as much. Um, I think if you can organize everyone's schedules to where you can see them in off weeks, it's way less combative. Uh, there's more time to work through things, discuss things. Um, I still love being out there watching them compete. I watch my players play a lot of golf. I've always been on the golf course when they're competing. Um, I don't know how you teach them if you don't do that. Um, but yeah, I think that. Do you, do you have guys or ladies that just don't want you out on the road with them? They rather do it at home. Like I, that's how I would, I'd rather have them when I was at home. I could feel yeah. like I could get more done, work on it before I got there. Cause when I got there, man, it was like, Lydia was like, I just got to hit it to a hundred yards. I don't care. You know what I mean? Like you're totally, yeah, you know, totally. But, yeah. No, you for have sure. Students it, that are that way. They say, Sean, you cannot come out. <laughs> no, I had a couple, like when I was with Sean Hogan, I, he was out a couple of times. Like, Oh, I don't want to see you. Really? <laughs> But that, I mean, everybody's different. Like, I mean, that's. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it, it just, it, it just depends if that's the case. I mean, I'm probably that way the most with the young ones because I've, I've tried to get them to like, you know, let's reap the rewards of my experience, but also understand that you've got to learn this wisdom on your own right. too. Like yeah. there, you, you can't, you see them make a mistake. Sometimes you just got to let them make it knowing that they probably won't make it after that. But you know, it's like, if you tell people not to run down to the shore because there's a fire, then everyone's going to go that way. So I think, yeah, Cameron, Sam, Lydia, because of what, how we work and how we get to do it they're, they're I mean, Cameron's worked on the same three things since he was 15 years old. Um, Lydia is basically going to work on the same two things till she retires. Uh, Sam, the same two things for him, not the same things. They're, they're unique to the individual. Um, but we've already seen like, wow, these things really help. Uh, so the key is just not coming up with new solutions to old problems. Right. Right. Well, we all, I mean, I know when I hit certain shots, I know what I did. Right. <laughs> and it's just, it's always there. I always have a tendency to aim right and come over the top. Right. I'm always going to do that. Yeah, Unless exactly. I, you 100%. know, everybody has their tendencies. So, too. Yeah. yeah. You might've played your best when you were just slightly right of it and slightly over it, but if it got right. too much, then you couldn't, then you could, you could, yeah. yeah, you didn't have certain shots you needed to compete. Right. So I read somewhere in an article that uh, you charge your clients 5% of their winnings. How did you come up with 5%? I don't know. When I came up with that, I just, there wasn't really, I, when I first, when, when Stephen Ames first uh, worked with me at the end of those three days, he gave me a check for 30 grand to take care of my expenses for the next year. Um and then said, I'll pay you 3% of what I earn on the golf course, uh, bonus you if I win. Was that in Canadian or American money? <laughs> American. Okay. That's good. I like that. I like that. But, but I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know what the deals were. Some guys were charging by the hour. Some guys weren't charging at all. They were just, uh, the PGA tour players were allowing them to put them on their website and, and use them in their marketing. Um, I didn't have a website. I actually only started on social media a year ago. Um, um, and I would have preferred not to, but anyways, the, cause we would have never met. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that, that, that I didn't really know what the deal was. And so then as I started coaching other players, I realized that everyone kind of had their own deal, uh, and how they looked at it. But to me, for what I intended to do, what I knew I could do, the idea of like 2% capped at 70 grand just wasn't going to do it for me because, I thought, okay, if I start with a player, he makes 1.5 a year. 
if we make say 5 million the next year, uh, which we've done a few times, um, is that worth 70 grand for me to make you an extra 3.5 million? I don't think so. That, I mean, I think at the end of the day, to, 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 if any company had that expense versus that margin, you know, the IRS would be there right the next day. Right. So um, I thought, I, I thought 5% was, I, I think I started that 5% uh, deal um, on, on tour. So I think as time goes by, you, know, you look at Butch Harmon, he went to like a salary and then a percentage. I think he earned that. Um, so if you feel like you get to the point where you earned it, then you ask that demand of the players. And if they're in, they're in. And if they're not in, they're, uh, they're, they're not in. But uh, I think 5% uh, has been fair, you know. So between me and the caddy that we make up 13%. So 87% of the players' success comes from them and 87% of their failures come from them. And I think that's – you got to make that mandatory up front that they recognize that. I'm going to give right. you everything I've got, but um, – I've had some funny five percent discussions with players on <laughs> on what you bring to oh, on what you bring what you bring to the table, and you're like five uh, percent. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious! So we're gonna finish up with uh, yeah. Sean here. You're gonna stick with us for a second. We're gonna do a little uh, bonus section. Um, thanks so much uh, for watching the uh, or listening to the Club Team Sports Golf yeah. Podcast. Sean, thanks for joining us. We thank appreciate you, it. Um, pleasure. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for being you and for for starting the hell up. She never talks back to us. So it's nice. All right.